Think it's too close to go. Great. So um, I'm really pleased to introduce to you Thor, Thor A. Rain, who I have known for almost a year, I believe. Mm. We yeah. met. We met, and before we, I start the introductions, you see, I didn't need to start a step. I'm going to pin the two of us so that you can see us both at the same time, which is much better than the screens going backwards and forwards. Um, so bear with me a moment. And there we go. So, yeah, so, so on, and we met in a networking group called Drive the Network, which is run by an amazing lady called Anne Hawkins. Um, and I think I've known you for almost a year now. So I'm going to start by um, introducing the two of us. Um, as probably most of you know, but maybe not all of you know, I'm a relationship coach. And I do quite a lot of mental health work as well. Um, and I have a, because I went to boarding school, I have a particular experience, interest in people who experience abandonment or separation as children. Um, I've got two degrees in psychology, which I got in the 70s and 80s, which was a long time ago. And one of those is in developmental psychology, so that's about children. Um, before I started working, um, sorry, before I started my family, I used to work in a London council doing crime prevention and civil liberties work, which probably most people don't know about me, um, which is a really interesting job. But then I left that to go and live in Belgium for five years with my now ex-husband. Um, and while I was in Belgium, I retrained and then went on to work as an osteopath for 20 years, which I finally gave up last May, having decided that I couldn't do two jobs at the same time. Um, but I spent 15 of those years of osteopathy working with people with ME and chronic fatigue syndrome. And that brought me to recognition of the role of childhood trauma for a lot of those patients um, in de de the development of their illness. And then in 2016, I started uh, training to become a coach, started with neurolinguistic programming, and then went on to train as a clarity coach with a guy called Jamie Smart, which is based on the idea that we are all part of something bigger than ourselves, that we're not separate, and that pretty much all our experience, about 100% of the time, it's created from the inside out. Um, and then I got a certification as a women's coach as well. And then I decided to stop doing coach training. Um, so I did. I have had a rather dysfunctional relationship history, which kind of reflected the trauma of being a boarding school um, until I met my current partner. Um, so I've had years of counselling, but the biggest step for me into healing was the three principles, which I learned when I did my coach training and the training and the being coached itself, of course, having a coach makes a huge difference. And then the second big step was meeting my current partner, um, who just happens to also have been to boarding school. So we know each other, we understand each other quite well. And it's that thing about mm, a feeling of safety and, um, what's known as relational mindfulness. So always keeping the relationship front and centre, um, when you're mon managing your own behavior. So that's me. Um, so I'd love to introduce you now, Thor A. Rain. Thor is a health activist, uh, a pain and fatigue specialist, and a social entrepreneur. Um, and they're the author of a brand new book, First Aid for Feelings. And I know that you had seven boxes of books delivered this morning, Thor. Yeah. So uh, usually we'll be doing book signing on Saturday and it's going to be in the <laughs> post on Monday. So yes. I I've got my copy coming sometime soon, I hope, and I'm really looking forward to reading it. So Thor has helped thousands of people feel better mentally, physically, and socially. They themselves recovered from complex PTSD, ME or chronic fatigue syndrome, and fibromyalgia, having been told by the doctors that well, you'd never recover. I was told in very certain terms that I would never recover, yes. Yeah. There were some very mean, well-meaning doctors, actually, who really thought they were giving me good advice, but clearly yes. wrong. And were wrong. As I can also testify having my experience with ME patients. So it was during the recovery that Thor developed the first aid for feelings method, which includes the ABC technique. I'm looking forward to, to learning about more about that and the first aid kit for feelings. Um, and, and having recovered, Thor went on to complete a master's degree and a clinical diploma, which included clinical hypnosis, neuro-linguistic programming, emotional freedom technique and coaching. So it's quite a broad spectrum. Um, and working with patients, Thor realized that the first aid for feelings method was helpful for others as well. And so after working with this method in consultations for the last 13 years, Thor's taught, sorry, Thor taught the first workshop in 2013 and galvanized by the success of your patients. Um, you set up a social enterprise in 2015 to help others 
called the helpful clinic mm. which i just love that it's like is it helpful yes or no um and the clinic's social mission is to improve people's health and well-being by increasing health and emotional literacy and this is done through consultations workshops and meditations on the insight timer platform which might be worth explaining to people actually thought because apart from maybe one person here might know what that is and then of course the new book the first aid for feelings manual yes so i just want to say thank you for being here it's great to have you and and to all the people who've come to to watch i'm just going to check that there's nobody lurking in the there's somebody in the waiting room the trouble is i open up my crib sheet and then i can't see who's in the waiting room so i've got some questions and as we've been talking in all of the pu the publicity about this about crocodiling i just wanted to ask you what do you mean by crocodiling so hi uh, and hi everybody both those of you who are know and those of you who are meeting for the first time it's really great to have you here um what really drives me is that i'm kind of first and foremost a health activist you know so i've definitely got that activism mojo so uh, meeting new people uh is always lovely making connections with others people who are curious about kind of health and well-being and of course, relationships are just an integral part of that. Uh, I think, you know, we're always in relationship, at least to self, you know, there's always primarily the self relationship and then relationship with others. And so crocodiling is something that happens quite frequently in relationships, uh, in, you know, or in our experience. So understanding what it is can really help shape uh, the way we then respond to it. So, uh, Sorrel, you mentioned the mission, which is to improve health and emo health and well-being through increased emotional and health literacy, which is lots of syllables, lots of big words. Lots of words. Actually, basically what that means is that we know how to read and respond to our feelings. So this is the literacy bit and the sort of and feel better. So when I'm able to read and respond to my feelings, I'm able to find my way forward in ways that helps me feel better. And when we are crocodiling, this is when we are basically reacting, we're snapping from the oldest part of our brain, which is uh, often referred to as the reptilian part of the brain, hence the word crocodile. And I think for me, uh, for the longest time, I thought this was like a metaphor uh, until I did some studying and actually realized, no, this is not a metaphor. Literally, oldest part of our brain is in its neural structure the same as a crocodile so and i found that quite reassuring as a little bit scary as well but i realized actually that and uh, that makes more sense to me when sometimes when i haven't got access to those higher functioning parts of my brain i can sometimes behave in a way that feels almost like out of character and i'm snapping or you know and then i'm oh my dear god i can't believe i just said that or did that or i wish i hadn't done that um and so really recognizing the power, if we think about it, it's not quite anatomically correct, but if we think about a third of the brain is basically operating at that level, expecting me always to be aligned and mindful and skillful isn't really realistic. It isn't really fair. And although I'd like to be a mindful, skillful, you know, uh, person all the time, that is in the current context, particularly, it's just not fair on myself to have that expectation. So how can I readjust my expectations and therefore be gentler to myself? And then when I'm able to really understand my own or be more realistic about myself and be gentle with myself, then I'm also able to be gentler and more realistic to other people. So if I then go do, I'll zoom a little bit out into a bit of theory, but I'll do it using my favorite brain dude, uh, Professor Linden. He's from... Um, Johns Hopkins University in the States. So he came up with this metaphor of the three scoop ice cream for the brain. So I don't know if anybody here has heard that, uh, that reference before. Have you heard of your brain as an ice cream? <laughs> well, you know, I, you know, I quite like basic, you know, and apart from I love ice cream. It's one of my first date. It's in my first date kit for feelings, actually. Sometimes ice cream is the only thing that will help. So the, his model is basically that if you've had a three scoop ice cream, you know, it comes in a cone. So the cone is basically in the neck down. And then the bottom scoop is the, the, the crocodile scoop. This is that reptilian part of the brain. The middle scoop is what I refer to as the group scoop. It's the mammalian part of the brain, often referred to as the limbic system, if you know kind of sciencey stuff. And that's the part of the brain that's more about social intelligence, emotional intelligence, relationships, being able to kind of have that group experience. So all mammals, like horses, dogs, dolphins, we live in groups. 
So that kind of able to read and respond to other people's feelings is a big part of what happens in that part of the brain. And then the top scope is kind of like behind the forehead, the frontal lobe or the prefrontal lobe. And the wriggly stuff, if you've ever seen a picture of a brain, the wriggly stuff is a cortical brain or the cortex of the brain. So that's the theory bit, the three scoop ice cream. It's not quite anatomically correct, but it gives us a bit good enough sort of measure or sense of the brain. Now, the thing is, particularly the top scope, but all three scopes take up a lot of energy to run. So if you think about it, when your brain is just resting and doing nothing, it's using 20% of all your available energy. That's not even when you're doing lots of thinking, that's just you idling, yeah? And like one of the people I supported, she was like, okay, so if I have five oranges, a whole orange goes into just running the brain. I was like, yes. Um, so of course, when we're under any kind of threat, when we're any kind of distress, what the body does is to direct resources away from the brain and to our heart, our lungs, our muscle groups to then deal with whatever tigers are prowling the perimeter. And so the first thing to go is our top scoop. Yeah, our kind of reflective, our ability to think about thinking, our ability to operate, you know, pinning people up front on Zoom, you know, or able to find your login details on Zoom, that gone. If you then increase the threat levels even more, we drop the group scoop. So we're, you know, that, if, and then we're only, what we got left is the crocodile part of our brain. And what can be helpful to think about to get sort of a, a thought reference for this is when we have all our scoops aligned, when our stress levels are, you know, fine, there's no stress, we're kind of in maintenance, we're tootling along, life is all fine, fine and safe. So we're going to that kind of abandonment aspect of, of coming from a boarding school background. We're able to have the kind of thoughts that are, we're all in this together. We can see the bigger picture. We can see our shared humanity. We're able to do deep listening. We're able to see that kind of, the highest potential in ourselves and people around us, because we've got that capacity in our brain. We've got, so rather we've got access to that capacity in our brain. And then as we lose our top scoop, the stress levels are going out. We're not in it together with everybody. It's us and them. We go into tribal, tribal feelings. And that can be, you know, us and your family. You know, it's like in-laws are the other. Or if you're in work, it's like the management is the other. Or if you're management, then it's the, it's the staff that are just the other. Or you can see it, you know, we're in a very heightened context at the moment, you know, where there's wars, really intense wars with some horrific suffering going on. And there's a lot of tribal where people really struggling to see the shared humanity of what's going on. And we're only able to see us and you and you're the ones making us suffer. If you jack up the, the uh, stress levels even more, we lose even a sense of group and we're into it's me versus the rest of the world. So that's like, I'm all alone, nobody helps me, uh, you know, all of that kind of, and this often happens in marriages or close relationships when we feel like I'm having to do all the laundry, all the cleaning, all the bills, all the, all the, all the, all the, I'm, I'm the only person single-handedly holding this family up. Now, chances are that's not entirely true. And that if you, when you are feeling more relaxed, when you're feeling less overwhelmed, when you're feeling, you know, well slept, well fed, well watered, well loved, you're able to have more of a shared understanding of how this household is operating. And it might be okay, if there is some disparity on who's doing what, then that could be, okay, let's get curious about that and see what's possible to do to balance that out. But then you're entering that conversation from a place of curiosity rather than from the crocodile of you are all, you know, bad for making me do everything. And I think this is where crocodiling is the interesting term. And I've been talking about the crocodile part of the brain. It was actually working with somebody in a consultation where she changed it into a verb because she told me, I realized my husband was crocodiling and I didn't have to crocodile back. So rather than he said, burr, 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 you know, whatever it was, and instead of her going like, well, you blah, 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 blah. She didn't do that. She responded differently, which meant that he was unable to care for what was going on for him and bring down those intensity levels. And then they could find a way together forward. 
So that's kind of the, the small, medium and slightly longer version of crocodiling with the kind of anatomy and biochemistry in the mix. So does that make sense, Oral? It certainly makes sense to me. And maybe if it if other people here, it doesn't make sense to, we can come to that in the Q&A. Definitely. Um, yeah. I, and I love the three scoop ice cream thing. I've always used the this baseball glove traditionally in America. Yeah. But yeah, the three scoop ice cream is kind of, it's tasty. So it's good. Exactly. And also, you know, I think it's that kind of, we all had one and yeah, the nice associations with ice cream, you know, and all of those kind of things, I think. And it's part of that, you know, I can go more. I love the kind of sciencey part. So you have to kind of stop me not going into too technical, but I think. <laughs> I was thinking that earlier. So actually, yeah, um, but I think it's that kind of also yeah. just a very simple metaphor. It's like sometimes we make things too complicated. Yes. And we don't need to complicate things. No, nope. only need as much information as will move us forward. So you kind of already answered the question of what kind of circumstances trigger crocodiling. Well, um, well I, I'd like to give that a bit more context oh, because then, that be it's not good. always obvious what sets the crocodile, you oh, know, yeah. what what gets you to lose your top scope and your group scope. So it can feel when we're threatened. So like, for example, if if we haven't got, you know, strong connections, we've had abandonment issues mm. or we've like, I came through, I had a complex PTSD mm. as well as the health issues. And a big part of that were childhood traumas. So for the, those of you to use another kind of um, metaphor, for those of you who haven't heard of ACEs, A-C-E, which stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences, for those of us who've got few ACEs, so I had quite a few ACEs in my pocket, which then contributed to the whole complex PTSD. But, you know, for those of us who have got ACEs, whenever there's a trigger, so like one of my experiences was childhood sexual abuse. So when I saw somebody resembling the person who had abused me, I would react. And that had nothing to do with people who were, even I remember seeing somebody on the train who visually resembled the person who per perpetrated the abuse. And I could feel myself starting to crocodile because I felt threatened because I hadn't worked through the trauma of that. So uh, for those of us who have got some ACEs in our pockets, we can have triggers that we're not even aware of. But the way it shows up is that our response is disproportionate to the situation. So uh, another way that, uh, another factor that can trigger the uh, crocodile that isn't always obvious is hunger. I know about that. Uh, we've talked about hangry. You may <laughs> yeah, have heard yeah. hangry <laughs> over the years. So that kind of came into the vocabulary about 10, 15 <laughs> years ago. So, I, I mean, I tend to be able to, me and my crocodile tend to be reasonably okay on hunger, but I certainly know people who, if they get hungry, that anybody who gets between them and the fridge is just going to get it in the neck. It's just like, they're just, they become completely, you know, uh, uh, any kind of hunger will set them off into a very aggressive mode or pass out. We can remember fight, flight or freeze, the stress mm -hmm. response doesn't always go to aggression. It can also go to flight where we just retreat or run away or crawl under a table or we go into paralysis we just go blank this is like the lights are on but nobody's home so hunger thirst lack of sleep you know so very basic things can get us get the crocodile activated mm -hmm. as well as things like hot and cold so any menopausal woman that has experience of hot flushes will be able to have some reference to the fact when she just went <clears throat> And, you know, it was just like, you know, and anybody who got in her way was just a high risk of injury, which wasn't anything about the other person. And I think also, I think for me, what I found so refreshing about understanding the, the chemistry of what's going on is that these are biological responses. If I was a menopausal woman and having a hot flush, that doesn't make me a bad person. You know, it's just this biology going on that's driving a certain behavior, which, yes, may not be skillful, may not be constructive to other people or even myself, but it's not a reflection on who I am. It doesn't mean I am this or that. That's really important to remember. Um, one of my favorite people is a guy called Bill Pettit. He's a psychiatrist and he says it's not who you are, it's where you are. Mm. And when you've considered that menopausal woman or that person who didn't sleep last night or that person who's really hungry, what they need is a bit of compassion. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, I crocodiled spectacularly last week. 
So, uh, so we've just finished very successful crowdfunding for the book and it's, it's great, but actually we're now in a period of lots of figuring lots of technical stuff, the printers, the platform, and, and I'm humans, I'm like, great. Technology rattles my crocodile. <laughs> and my one of my colleagues had sent an email that wasn't very skillful to, um, to one of our patients. It wasn't bad. I mean, it was a minor thing that he put in that he could have worked differently or done differently. My response to that was to send him an email back just to him. It's going, I wish you hadn't sent that, blah, blah, blah. Completely disproportionate. And entirely because I was, you know, crocodiling about technology. I was tired. You know, there were th you know, things going on that were about me, nothing about him. And so, you know, then he sent me an email back that was a bit like, what is going on with you? <laughs> <laughs> and then I was able to go, oh yeah, no, I'm crocodiling. And he's kind of going, hang on a minute. And so I was then able to email back and say, I'm so sorry, this is me crocodiling. Uh, you know, let's have, a, we're speaking next week. Let's actually talk about this, you know? And then we had a meeting this morning and I was like, talked about it, explained it, uh, found our way, you know, back to feeling connected again. But that was a really good example of something that's in my scary zone, which is technology, mm -hmm. coupled with me being tired, coupled with him making a relatively small, unskillful communication that just went <clears throat> way out of proportion. And I think that's the bit that that when we know we're crocodile or when we know, know to recognize we're crocodile, we're then able to own it. Yeah. And it doesn't make, again, it doesn't make me a bad person. It explains what's going on with my biochemistry. And then I'm able to communicate that to other people. And also it brings us to the question of what to do when you notice that your partner is crocodiling or your colleague is crocodiling or your, I don't know, your child is crocodiling. So how to, how to respond in that situation? So the first thing is always is when we, I think the first is knowing how to identify it. Because I think we, we can't really do the response before we've figured out what's going mm -hmm. on. So when somebody comes into your space, and often it's our loved ones, our partners or, or, or spouses, and they if something feels like really off, it's like disproportionate. It's like, yeah, okay, the, we, I didn't take the bin now, but really, you're losing the plot over the bin? You know, when the, when the aggression or when the, you know, the, the feeling you're getting feels overwhelming and like doesn't feel proportional to the situation that's going on. That's a sure far sign that there's some crocodiling going on. So that's the first one. The second one is to, um, when it feels really quick, you know, it's like, it's just somebody's just turned on a dime. Uh, that's also almost always a, an indicator that the person's crocodiling because that's when we've gone straight into crocodile, straight into survival response. And we haven't had the, the, the 37 seconds to actually think before something comes out of our mouth. So I think those are the two indicators that somebody is crocodiling. So something that feels really disproportionate, like really the bin's that important to you or whatever it is. And the other one is when it's happened really fast. So, okay, so let's say, um, or, or let's take another classic example, the toilet seat. Yeah, so I mean, how many marriages have faltered on the toilet seat. Yeah, and it tends to be not to be. And for those of you who don't know, I'm non-binary and transgender. So I travel across genders in various ways. So my experience of gender is slightly different, but I do know this on good authority from people who are, you know, men or women, that it tends to be men who leave the seat up and women who want the seat down. Mm -hmm. I also know that's not always the case because I do know a couple where it's the other way around, but that is certainly the minority. Yeah. So um, in terms of that, so let's say the woman has walked into the bathroom, sees the seat up and goes, you, you know, storms out of the bathroom and then has a right all go at said husband for never putting the seat down. So if we think about what is actually going on in that situation, is it about the toilet seat? unlikely what's much more likely is that the the woman in that situation is making the toilet seat putting down behavior mean something and that if husband isn't putting the toilet seat down that means he doesn't care about her or whatever it is there can be a number of different reasons that 
you know, that, that can be affecting the mean, the significance of the toilet seat, plus the fact that maybe, you know, she is menopausal or she hasn't slept or she's hungry or, or whatever else is going on. Yeah. The husband now has a choice. He could go into a huff and go like, well, I, I, this, the toilet is equally mine, 50-50. It's my choice to leave the seat up. It makes, I don't have to put the seat, to lift it up so I can have a pee, you know, what, blah, 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 blah. So for him that in that situation, if he crocodiles back, is it really about the seat? Is it about feeling that I have lost some autonomy over how I choose to pee or not pee? So, so that's one thing. The other thing is actually, rather than seeing the woman's kind of crocodiling as a personal attack about the toilet seat, or her trying to manipulate me into doing things this way or that way, to go, ah, right, she is getting worked up at the toilet seat. What is going on here? That's a clue to me. You know, and so I can, okay, I can hear you talking about the toilet seat. But I'm wondering, actually, you know, is there something, are you stressed? Is there stuff going on? Is there anything else that could be contributing to the toilet seat thing that's going on in this moment? And possibly she may be able to say, uh, yeah, yeah, there is. Yeah. And then you can take it, you can find your way forward from there. But if you haven't learned about crocodile and you haven't had this conversation before, it's likely that she will just go, don't try and make this about anything else. It is about the toilet seat. Oh, yeah. I was thinking that thought. <laughs> exactly. So, again, coming back to the reading and responding, coming back to the literacy, you mm. know. So when we're in, because remember, when we are crocodiling, we haven't got access to the part of our brain that can think this through. Mm. We haven't got access to the part of the brain that can do pattern spotting, that can go, oh, yeah, no, I haven't eaten, I haven't slept, I've been up with the kids all night. My boss has just had a, you know, bollocking with me last week or whatever, you know. So this is, tends to be something we need to have talked about beforehand so that both parties have got an understanding of what crocodiling means and how it shows up. And then maybe even talked about, because that's another thing we can do in relationships, is to identify what are our key points. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I don't really give a diddly squat about the toilet seat. But I'm quite precious about the sink. <laughs> and many of us have our thing. I know one person who was really attached to the to the um, remote controls, that they all lined up, they were all put in the same place at the end of the night. So I still haven't figured out why we get attached to these things. But all I do know is that we, we tend to have something in our living quarters, in our living space, which we tend to share with our loved ones that is precious to us. And when we know that about each other and we can bring in that, I think you were talking about that curiosity and compassion, mm. we can bring those things together and go like, ah, okay, I've just pressed your trigger button, you know, toilet seat, remote control, sink, whatever it is. So when you are, you know, when you are vulnerable, when you're likely to be sort of flammable, <laughs> likely <laughs> to be crocodiling, then of course that's where it's gonna go. So I can then see this, let's go back to the toilet seat. If I'm the bloke in that situation, I can see that this is not you trying to take away my autonomy and my, you know, so that I'm entitled to leave the seat up. So I'm, I can see that it's not actually about me. It's about me doing something that affected your trigger. Yes. So I think those kind of understandings when we're able to bring that in a little bit of humor, you know, I think also, us humans, we tend to think of ourselves as all enlightened. We're all, we, we all want to be top scooping all the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, uh, I've, I've had dogs in my life for a long time and it's often find it quite helpful to remind myself that two thirds of my brain is operating at the level of my dog, Denny. You know, that's the, that's the group scoop, you know, or your cat, Bob, or whatever it is, you know. <laughs> it's like when we see ourselves from a biology perspective, rather than from this very high expectation of top scooping all the time. I think we can be much gentler with ourselves and our spouses and the people around us. And, and that's, again, it's about compassion, isn't it? Yes. Because it's not compassionate to expect anyone to top scoop all the time. That's just not realistic. I, I was just going to say, it's like, really? highly unrealistic, yes. Exactly. <laughs> and, and I was thinking also, that, I mean, the toilet seat is quite an interesting one. 
um you know for some women you have to get on the loo really fast and yeah. you to change your underpants yes and if the seats up it might be the missing two because if you've got one of those soft clothes toilet seats that come down mm-hmm. while you watch the paint dry yeah <laughs> and so it might seem like a minor thing but when yes. you actually and it's a funny thing because what it is about it's about you the man having the respect to think it through oh yeah of course that's why she keeps having so many pairs of knickers in the wash because i don't put the toilet seat down yeah so very so funky, yeah. as well the generosity of giving information yes and the love and being curious about the other person yeah, absolutely I show my love by being curious about your reality. Yeah. And for, for, for those of you who don't know, but cisgendered men, so those are men who were born or assigned the male gender at birth, they will not know, or any, any people who haven't given birth, for example, because often those kind of issues are more likely for people who've given birth. Yeah. You know, so for people who haven't given birth, it can be really hard for them to relate to sort of uh, that kind of leakage because they just haven't had that experience. So it wouldn't be at the top of them, it would, it, not even at the back of them, like, they just wouldn't have the information. And actually we don't share it because of the shame. Right. So that's the next part. Oh, yeah? bring it to the next part, please stop. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, so how are we doing for time? So You've we're just coming up to the half hour. Yeah, and actually we need to set the time for Q&A. Yeah. So if I just do a quick, quick little sh- into shame Please. yeah so uh so for those of you who work with me or know me you will know that i always my my belief is that all feelings are information yeah so if you haven't heard me say this before it might take a little while to work that you know to kind of really kind of get it and i'm always happy to take we can talk about any q a or you know any kind of questions in social media or email afterwards definitely up for that but basically Feelings, which are emotions and physical sensations. So that's pain, fatigue, stress, anxiety, shame. They're information about something. So shame always, always arises around beliefs. So the belief that I should be X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Now, the difference between shame and guilt is that guilt tends to be about behavior. I shouldn't have done this or I should have done this or you know, something like that. Shame tends to be about my identity. It tends to be about who I am. So if I am a woman who can't hold my waters, then that makes me something. Mm. I don't know, it makes me a bad person mm. or makes me unskillful or makes me you know, embarrassing to other people or whatever. And we can have a lot of these messages from our family and childhood coming into teenage years and bedwetting is a big issue for children and and teenagers and even going into adulthood it's interesting if we look at the male side of you know just having a pee often there can be a lot of shame around toilet anxieties uh so men uh, uh, particularly men with penises can have a lot of issues about peeing in public because they're basically expected to get their penis out and pee in a urinal in front of lots of other guys and for some some of us, that's just like highly uncomfortable. So we can end up with a lot of urinary issues because we struggle to go for a pee. But that's another another perspective. Coming back to shame. So if you remember the three scoop ice cream, so shame is very much in the group scoop part of things. Because if it wasn't for other people, we wouldn't feel shame. Shame is always in relation to other people. Uh, who then shame us directly, or we internally shame ourselves before anybody else gets a chance to. Yeah. And so things like menopause, things like, you know, leakage, things like Tina Pats or whatever, these were even just periods not being blue. I mean, f- for decades, we have had period pads advertised with blue blood. I mean, it's just like, really? <laughs> <laughs> And it's only what? recently, I think it's one of the period that um, advertisers, literally in the last year or two, has got it red. But then it's, it's not full red, it's slightly sort of subdued. But, you know, it's like all of these things, they are social constructs. They are not actually about me as an individual or you as an individual, but we're buying into that something shameful about these things. So recognizing there's a social component to shame, recognizing the shame is about how I perceive myself as a person, it, I'm, it's about my identity of who I am rather than just something I do, which makes it much more disruptive, 
mm. uh, debilitating to our sense of self. But also that kind of sense that we often try and shame ourselves first before anybody else gets a chance to. And this is my final piece on shame. So anybody here familiar with Brini Brown? Yeah. So mm -hmm. Brini Brown is like basically a shame researcher. She has spent thousands of hours researching shame. And the biggest single point of power in shame is silence. So shame is kept in place by not talking about it. And so the whole shame about, you know, if I, if the toilet seat is up, I am much more vulnerable to wetting or likely to wet my knickers. And therefore there are that many underpants in the laundry. Is that if I don't speak about it, the shame will only intensify. Whereas if I say it, it's almost like one of those spells. It just goes poof. Mm. That's so two true. reasons. First of all, we said it out loud and we haven't died. <laughs> the crocodile part of our brain always thinks we're going to die. And there's biological reasons for that, which we haven't got time to go into, at least not. Maybe in the Q&A, we'll see. So first of all, we haven't died. Secondly, as soon as one person says it, almost always there's like three more who go like, oh yeah, I have that experience too. Or, I know somebody who did that too or whatever. So as soon as it's said, as soon as it's shared, shame just goes Maybe like anxiety as well can be yeah when you say i'm anxious because i'm afraid of being anxious yes yeah it it just it just evaporates in a puff of logic yeah yeah so i think just to summarize before we go into the q a this kind of idea of crocodiling really recognizing that although we think we're all top scoops all the time, you know, our, you know, we have big picture, we're able to be all mindful and whatever, uh, actually our, our, the way we respond and what we're able to re read is heavily influenced by biology and biochemistry. And the biggest deciding factor there is adrenaline and cortisol, so the stress hormones. Mm. And if you think about it, almost like, you know, a sound engineer's mixing desk, the higher the adrenaline, the less brain you have. That's basically what's it. <laughs> so you know the more the less adrenaline more brain power or more access to your brain to be technically accurate yeah and that when we're crocodiling we there's no point in reasoning with anybody who's crocodiling because they haven't got access to the part of the brain who does that so comfort compassion curiosity mm -hmm. slowing things down even just food and water mm -hmm. you know and you know and i love like in england uh, so i'm originally from iceland been here since 99, so last century. But I think one of my favorite parts about British people or British culture is putting the kettle on. Mm. I actually wrote a blog that's like Britain's greatest contribution to psychology is putting the kettle on. Because what does that do? It's a it's a it's a pause button, it's a stop. Mm. So somebody's crocodiling, you, you know, you have to fill the kettle with water, you have to put it on the thing, you have to put it on the bowl, it takes about two minutes, and then it's like this tea or that tea, and then it's like milk or no milk. And what you're doing through all of that sort of ritual is slowing things down. And then guess what? You have a warm drink that you can hold. You can hold in your hand. You've got a warm drink, which brings comfort mm -hmm. to the crocodile. Yeah. And then we can go, okay. So like from, if, if it's me and myself and I was like, okay, honey, what's going on? Or if it's, you know, I've, I'm in two relationships. So I have two partners. If it's one of my partners, like, okay, sweetheart, what's going on? You know? So it's that kind of, we've got a cup of tea. It's an invitation to talk. Okay, let's get curious. It is, uh, the cup of tea is an amazing thing. I agree. Yeah, there was one other thing I wanted to ask you before we go into the Q&A, which is just about the, the ABC that you talk about in First Age of Feelings. Could you quickly run, spy, run that by us? Uh, yeah, so I'm just mindful of the science of a lot of time for Q&A. So the really quick whoosh, version yeah. of that is um, so you may be familiar with medical first aid, which is airways, breathing and circulation. So the feelings first aid follows the same thing, but it's awareness, breath and body and choice. Before you become aware of anything, you can't do anything about it. If you're not aware, if we don't know what we don't know, we can't do anything about it. So becoming aware of what's going on is the first bit. 
The second part, the breath and body, is then to pay attention to your breathing. And in the first aid for feelings manual, we've got all the, there's lots of details on that. There's also on the on the first aid for feelings.com website, there are blogs about the ABC that you can find out more. And breathing techniques to kind of shift the biochemistry in the body. Remember, less cortisol, more brain. So the breath particularly helps to shift that, but also come into your body, shuffling your shoulders, sitting bones, twiggling your toes. All of that kind of stuff helps us remember that we're not just this brain walking around. We've actually got a whole body. We can feel our feet. We can come to the ground. And then choice is the third step is that, okay, the way I'm responding, what's going on, is it helpful? And chances are it's not helpful. So we then, okay, what might be more helpful instead? And again, in the book uh, and also in some of the blogs, you can find further questions that you can then ask to help you get more, get through to a more helpful choice. So is it helpful to argue over the toilet seat? Possibly not. What might be more helpful? Put in the kettle and, okay, let's do that. And then we can find a way forward from there. Brilliant. Yeah, I'm going to st stop recording before we go into the Q&A. Um, Zoom has just taken away all the images of all the people.